Hey guys, we hope you enjoy this free clip of Aggressive Progressives on the Young Turks. This is just a preview of what you will receive with TYT membership. That means exclusive interviews, panel discussions, and more of Jimmy, and of course, me. Check out this next clip, and if you like what you see, you can access full episodes of Aggressive Progressives by becoming a member. Head to tyt.com slash join now. We have a special guest joining us. We're very excited. Uh, Stephanie Kelton is a professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University. She was also chief economist on the 2015 U.S. Senate Budget Committee for the Minority Party staff and an economic advisor to Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign. She founded the New Economic Perspectives blog and is a leading proponent of modern monetary theory. Political named her one of the 50 thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming America in politics in 2016. Please welcome Stephanie Kelton. Hi, Stephanie, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, I have a lot of questions. We're very dumb here, <laughs> um, so we're like normal people. And first, could you explain how does math work? And then we'll go from there. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, I'm teasing. But okay, I, <laughs> my first question is people, um, now just for instance, uh, they just passed an $80 billion extra on top of the Pentagon budget, but they didn't raise taxes to pay for that. And I, so where does that money come from? And explain to me what modern uh, monetary theory is. Well, where the money comes from is the congressional authorization. So what members of Congress have the authority to do is to authorize spending on behalf of the US government. And so that's what happened. The Pentagon said, we would like a certain amount of money. And enough members of Congress said, you can have it, and just for good measure, we're gonna throw in another 80 billion. And the question is, how did they do that? And the answer is they voted for it. And where does the money come from? It came from Congress's decision to authorize that spending to take place. I mean, that's how Congress uh, finances all of its spending. It doesn't go out like you and I might. If we were gonna buy a new car and we go out and we have to prearrange our financing and we have to make sure that somebody's willing to lend us the money or we can't drive the car off the lot, Congress is the source of the money. And so all it takes, it, you don't find the money, you find the votes. And if Congress votes for something, the spending is triggered. And it all happens behind the scenes in a fairly complicated way. But the Treasury and the Federal Reserve work together to make sure that Congress doesn't bounce a check. The other question you asked is about modern monetary theory. It's a little harder to answer the question, what is it? Because it's maybe the greatest group project um, ever, under an, uh, ever undertaken in the field of economics. It's um, an approach or an economic school of thought that unlike like um, the monetarist school where you had Milton Friedman as the guy behind it or um, you know Keynesian economics where you had John Maynard Keynes as the intellectual father of the school, with MMT or modern monetary theory, what you have um, are a group of economists, originally maybe half a dozen or so, working collectively to build a, a body of economics, an understanding of how the economy works, uh, how money works, modern money works. And we put literature together now going on more than 20 years. So it's a big school of thought with a lot of scholarship behind it. And it answers questions ranging from trade policy and uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy, how the economy works. So it's a big, big group project. So, so, when, so when Congress passes an authorization to increase the Pentagon budget, $80 billion, now, $80 billion extra goes out to defense contractors and what have you to pay for bombs and to pay for, you know, K rations and whatever, and for uniforms yeah. and boots and rifles and for everything, yep. right? So now where does that money come from? So we didn't raise a tax. So where, now where does the, who writes the check and where does it come from that money? So the US government writes the check. So you have heads of agencies, let's just say treasury writes the check. And that's where the money comes from. So, you know, sometimes in, in modern monetary theory, we'll ask people just to make it really simple. We'll say, think of the U.S. government as the scorekeeper for the U.S. dollar. So much like if you go to a, a football game or a basketball game and you're watching the scoreboard and you see one team just running up the score and you say, oh my God, look, it's, you know, 114 points already in this basketball game and we still have eight minutes to go. Where, what's going to happen if this team keeps scoring? Eventually the 
The scorekeeper is going to run out of points. How are they going to continue to put points on the board? Now, of course, nobody ever worries about whether the scorekeeper is going to be able to continue to mark up the number every time the team scores another basket or three, whatever it is, right? But somehow we get all confused and worried that, that at some point the United States government is going to run out of its own money or be unable to pay a bill that comes due in U.S. dollars when it's the sole source of the U.S. dollar. I mean, the government spends by some seller sells something to the government and the government tells its bank, the Federal Reserve, hey, that guy just sold me something. Go change the numbers in his bank account. So the numbers in his bank account go up, the check goes out, the check clears, and all of a sudden, let's say Lockheed Martin has more numbers in their bank account, right? And and so the question, where does the money come from? The answer is it comes from the Federal Reserve changing the numbers in Lockheed's bank account upward to reflect the fact that the government made a purchase. But doesn't that increase the deficit or the debt of the United States? So let, let's. So that's the thing I think people are having a hard time, I am having a hard time understanding, that you're saying that uh, it doesn't really matter how much tax revenue you have because the United States prints its own currency, and so we can just keep writing checks. That's well, what it okay, sounds okay. like. Okay, so let's, let me go back, because I don't want to be uncareful, and I don't want to give the impression that I'm suggesting that the government never needs to increase a tax and can just print money to pay for everything. What I'm saying is, um, your your question is, doesn't that mean a deficit? Well, it might, okay? It depends. So if Congress goes out and um, budgets for a variety of things, not just defense spending, but education and infrastructure and a whole range of things, right? The, The federal government budget. If it writes a budget that produces such a good economy that tax revenues are flowing in and the government ends up collecting more than it spends into the economy, then you don't get a deficit. You might end up, in fact, with a budget surplus like we had in 1998, 99, 2000, 2001. More likely, though, the government is doing the right thing, right? It's making a contribution to the rest of the economy by spending more into the economy than it is taking back out through taxation. So with simple numbers, if the government spends a hundred billion into the economy, but it only taxes 90 billion out, we label that a budget deficit. We say to the government, you have run a deficit of 10 billion. And some people would say, shame on you, you irresponsible madman. You know, why are you doing this thing called deficit spending? And what MMT tries to do is go, hang on, hold on. Don't assume that the government did something that was necessarily uh, irresponsible or, or bad. They just made a net contribution of $10 billion to the economy. Why did it do that? Did it do that in order to produce a better economy? Did we get you know, something out of it? Did we get better roadways and bridges that aren't structurally deficient? Did we do something good with that money? And who got that money, right? Where did it go? So we could fight about whether the deficit is a good deficit or a bad deficit on those terms, but just saying the deficit itself is a reflection of a government that's done something wrong is completely missing the point. So you're saying that the money we spend isn't, it doesn't depend on how much money we tax forever? It can't. If- yeah, it can't. No, I mean, it can in your mind. You could say, I'm a member of Congress, and because I have a fear of deficits, or because I think my constituents have a fear of deficits, or because I think someone will primary me if I vote for this because it added to the deficit, I refuse to vote for things that aren't, quote, paid for. So you could have that situation, but what I'm saying is that when Congress sits down and produces a budget and votes to pass a budget, they don't have the slightest idea in advance what the taxes are going to be next quarter, the following quarter, that fiscal year, and so forth. They're just saying this is the amount of money that we are agreeing to spend on these line items in these different categories, and we're going to start triggering that spending. And then the taxes begin coming in. Every single day, IRS is processing some tax payment, corporate taxes, personal income taxes, and the rest. So tax revenue is, is being collected. Government is spending. And on balance, the difference between the two gets labeled a surplus, a deficit, or a balanced budget. But there's no kind of foresight. You just can't know in advance 
whether the amount that you're going to be spending into the economy is going to be fully offset by taking money back out through taxation, nor should you really care. So why, why should we not care about that? Why, aren't deficits bad? No. They're, so what I'm, what I'm just doing is trying to say, let's look at what the deficit is. And I do this all the time with big and small audiences where people, you know, like the average person, just doesn't know what the deficit is. They've heard the word. Usually they hear the word in the context of this is why we can't have nice things. So I write to my congressman. I say, why are our schools not better funded? Why, are our, why is our infrastructure not cared for? Why are our vets not cared for? You mentioned homeless. Why don't we do more to build housing and get people, you know, with safe places to live and off the streets? Why do we? And, and somebody goes, "Oh, I completely agree with you. I would love to be able to do these things, but the deficit, right?" So, to the extent that people understand the deficit, I think it's in those terms. It's that this thing is bad because it prevents us from having nice things and being able to do the kinds of things like Medicare for all or um, making public colleges and universities tuition free or paid vacation or whatever it is. We can't have it because we have a deficit. So what I try to do is talk my audiences and students and others through this and say, well, let's let's break it down so we understand the deficit as it really exists. Like, what is this thing that we label the deficit? So let's think about it as us versus them, because I think this makes it easier. So when people say the government is running a budget deficit, sometimes you'll read an article in the newspaper and it'll say all this red ink, right? Red ink, red ink. So if you think of the government's budget deficit as the red ink, then you have to think of our budget as showing up the black ink. So their red ink is our black ink. Their deficit is our surplus. Two sides of the same coin. So again, if the government spends 100 into the economy, somebody gets 100. Now they tax and they say, okay, we're going to come and collect taxes. We're going to tax 90 back out of the economy. So that pulls the income away from someone, right? And now the government has put in 100, taken out 90, and we say, you ran a deficit. Okay, but we have to look at what happened in the economy. In the economy, there's 10 sitting there that wouldn't have been there if the government hadn't run that deficit. So think about it. What if the government balanced its budget instead of running a deficit? Balancing its budget means, you know, living within its means, not spending more than it collects and all that kind of stuff, right? So let's do balanced budget. Now the government spends 100 into the economy, but it taxes 90, I'm sorry, taxes 100 back out balanced its budget, right? Only the economy was just deprived of the 10 that it had when the government was deficit spending, and now it doesn't have that 10. So again, the deficit is just the record of the contribution, financial contribution, that the federal government makes to the rest of the economy. That's all it is. So if if, if the United States uh, prints its own currency, why do we have to borrow money? That is such a good question. Nobody ever asked that question. We don't, we don't have to borrow money. We choose to borrow money because the financial industry, the middleman in this game, likes very much intermediating between the federal government and the rest of the economy. In other words, they want their cut. So the, the question is very astute. If we, can, if we control our own currency, if the US dollar comes from the US government and can't come from anywhere else, Why does the government pay interest to borrow its own currency? And that's a question I wish more people would wrestle with because it's a policy choice. We don't have to do it that way. And in fact, because we do it that way, you know, we're we're giving um, a subsidy to bondholders. We're saying to people, we're going to pay you some interest income for nothing, really. You know, you're not taking risk. Um, There's no risk of default associated with U.S. government securities with buying treasuries, but we're going to give you compensation anyway. We're going to pay you interest on those securities. The government could say, you know what, no more, no more treasuries. We're not borrowing anymore from this point on. When we spend, we're just going to spend into the economy and we're going to tax back enough to keep that spending from causing other problems in the economy like an inflation problem, but no more of this interest income. And then lawmakers wouldn't be so obsessed with this line item in the budget called interest on the debt because they freak out about this. They all see this and the cost of servicing the debt and they say, oh my God, 
we're spending all of this money servicing the debt and that money could go to something else. And they're absolutely right. How would you summarize what modern monetary theory is in just a minute or two? Is that possible to do? <laughs> I'll try. I mean, look, the bottom line is if you're a country like the US, like the UK, like Australia, like Canada, if you have your own currency and you borrow and spend and tax in your own money, then you have space to do things with policy that other countries don't have, that you can do things that Greece can't do or somebody like that. Okay, so you can run an economy the way you want to run it and you can have high levels of employment and you don't have to, quote, find the money. You're not on a gold standard. When somebody says, we're going to find the money, it's as if you're looking for something finite, something that exists, like there are only so many dollar bills in the world and they're in a pile somewhere. and We have to go compete and borrow and, and get a little bit of that and then we can afford to pay for programs and things that we care about. We went off the gold standard. We don't have some finite, concrete, limited thing that backs our currency or is our currency. And so we got to get over this obsession we have with finding the money and focus on funding priorities, uh, funding priorities, and then understanding that you tax not because the government needs money to pay for things, but because the government uses taxes to make some room for its own spending in the economy so that it doesn't create an inflation problem. So the, you're saying that the, it, it, in an economy where we print our own money, the purpose of taxes is to regulate inflation and other things like that? It's one important purpose of taxes. Yeah, a really important purpose. Okay, let me throw it over to my panel. Uh, go ahead, anyone take it away, Steve, Malcolm, Steph, who would like to have a question? My question was, uh, based on your premise that uh, deficits by themselves don't matter. It's, what matters is why we, I mean, how we spent that deficit dollars. Um, theoretically, we could have zero taxes and run ma massive deficits so long as it was all done in a smart way. But I imagine there are real life practical concerns and constraints that would limit you from doing that. You're saying uh, one of those would be inflation. So to uh, combat inflation, you do have taxes, you have um, other real life things like um, uh, actual raw materials and supplies where you can't just have an infinite quantity of that. Can you, I, I recall reading something about that in one of your articles. Can you explain a bit further um, how you have real life constraints on just printing endless amounts of money? Because I don't want people to take away from this conversation that Professor Kelton advocates just printing unlimited amounts of money. Okay, good. I don't want them to do that either. <laughs> and, and so uh, I appreciate that. What One point I would like to make is that I'm not proposing that the government change the way that it currently pays for the things that it buys or the services that, that it engages. The government already today, right now, as we sit here, pays for everything with newly created money. That's already how it works. So what MMT tries to do is explain the actual operations, the way that they work today. So it's not a proposal to change the way we do it and start printing money or something like that, it's just to recognize that when the government spends, it spends new money into the economy. So if you want to if you want to use the word print and think about it like a scorekeeper, you say, well, the government uses the print key on the keyboard and that's how it pays for new purchases. But when it taxes, it uses the delete key. So some of that money is just erased away, okay? I would not agree that we could just eliminate taxes altogether and still have a working monetary system with the US dollar at the center of it. Because the reason that the dollar is at the center in the first place is because the government defines the currency as the dollar and gets us all to want to work and earn it because we need it to pay our taxes. So you can't get rid of taxes altogether. Taxes play an important part in um, controlling for inflation, but they also play a role in helping to give value to the currency itself. So the other point you raise, which is super important, is the real resources question, because this is the limiting factor. This is how we should be thinking about the constraints or the limits that we face. Every single economy on earth has basically an internal speed limit. It can only grow so much given the labor that it has, the machines and the factories and the people's skills, like the technological know-how that exists, all of that stuff limits how much you can produce at any given time if you are efficiently using everything you have, okay? So what, what MMT does is say, 
Why don't we craft a budget, not worrying about whether it's going to show a deficit or how big a deficit, but why don't we craft a budget that says these are the things we're trying to achieve in the economy. These are We want to see child poverty driven to zero or poverty altogether in the economy driven to zero in 10 years time. We want to eliminate homelessness. We want to repair infrastructure. We want to make public colleges and you, you know, you figure out what are the goals you write a budget that reflects those goals, and then you say, but I can't do everything next year, so I have to prioritize. I look at my resources, how much can I do? And then you begin to spend into the economy to accomplish those broader economic and social objectives. Okay, I, uh, hi, Stephanie, this is Steph. I have a quick question. Hi, is PAYGO a good idea, and should Nancy Pelosi be suggesting the Dems will follow it when they, if they take over the House? Well, I heard you guys talk about Pago the other day on the show. So I know that you know that it is as crazy an idea as I think it is. So um, no, and I remarked publicly and gave some quotes to some folks on this. This this Pago idea is like the Democrats saying, listen, if we if we end up sweeping, if this blue wave is real and we take back the House in November, one of the first things that we intend to do is to return our budgeting practices to something called pay go, right? Pay as you go, not spend more than you take in. Everything has to be deficit neutral and paid for and all that kind of stuff. It's like saying, you know, we're gearing up for this big race. And the first thing we're going to do is tie our shoelaces together. So it's a terrible idea. What, what would be your um, guess as to why someone like Nancy Pelosi would propose such an idea if it handcuffs the progressive movement? I mean, I don't know the extent to which this is a political calculation on her part, that she believes this is actually helpful to the party in some sense, or whether it more reflects just her own belief in the righteousness of, of sound budgeting principles that she's convinced herself over many, many years. You know, this is someone who, after Pete Peterson died, you know, Pete Peterson, yes. the billionaire investor who, you know, passed away not too long ago, but this guy has funded, I, I don't know, there's an overarching Peterson Foundation. And then under that umbrella, there are dozens or hundreds of, of other organizations uh, my lights kicked out, but if I wave my hand, usually the light will come back on. That's very bizarre. It's motion sensitive. Um, you know, this is a guy who's been gunning for Social Security and Medicare and programs like that for a very long time. And the justification for attacking those programs for him and for the organizations that he fronts or funds has always been the national debt and deficits. So they use those as a way of going after um, you know, entitlement programs. And Nancy Pelosi went on the House floor after he died and felt compelled to actually use floor time to make a very colorful speech about what a tragic loss and wonderful uh, you know, human being this was. So I don't know what motivates the, the move. Before I throw it to Malcolm, who's going to take over in a sec, I just want to ask one more question of Stephanie. Why do you think it is that when, uh, when someone like, uh, like Bernie Sanders proposes uh, Medicare for all, which would actually save money, or proposes free college, which would actually increase, uh, boost our economy because you're investing in it, right? That's not like uh, a you're not spending money on a bomb, which just sits in the ground. You're investing in a human being, which goes out and pays more taxes. So my, my question is, when, why do you think it is that it's ubiquitous in the media and in politics that when someone like Bernie proposes a program that helps people, people always say, how are you going to pay for that? And that's a unicorn. But when someone proposes $80 billion for bombs, no one anywhere ever asks that. Do you have a theory on why that is? Um, because they understand that it's the most powerful way to kill the idea. Um, they get us fighting, you know, if, how are you going to pay for it? If the answer is, involves some new tax somewhere, then you've, you've accomplished the goal. Everyone will spend all of their time fighting over the numbers, your revenue estimate, who pays, uh, and they will completely look beyond the merits of the proposal, the morality of doing the right thing. The, the policy will get lost in the, in the background as everybody begins to just fight over the numbers and the pay for and whether it, the math adds up and all that kind of stuff. So they know, they know that it's the most effective so, way to kill. So you think it's just a cynical ploy for the establishment to kill social programs. That's why they say that. And then they get their, their mouthpieces in the media to repeat that? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, what did they do with the tax cuts? They were, you know, these guys are laser focused. They don't let questions like, how are you going to pay for it? Uh, hold their agenda hostage. They just run right through it. And they say, you know, well, it's going to pay for itself. And then somebody works up the numbers and says, oh, but the Congressional Budget Office says it doesn't pay for itself. And they go, yeah, they're wrong. Their numbers are wrong. They just they just dismiss everything that might possibly hijack their agenda. They are laser focused on delivering on their agenda for the donor class, for the people that they represent. And the Democrats haven't figured out how to do that. Um, I don't think the Democrats want to figure out how to do that. I don't think, I think it, you touched on it. Nancy Pelosi is pushing PAYGO because her donors want PAYGO. It's not just, just why did the Democrats get together to fast track 15 judges for Trump? Because the donors are the same people. The same donors to Trump are the same donors to Chuck Schumer and they want the same things. Let me throw it to Malcolm Fleshner. Malcolm, go ahead. Hi, Stephanie, thank you for, for talking to us today. Uh, I wanted, relating to the Nancy Pelosi PAYGO situation, I think that a, a lot of people, well, the deficit and the debt are real boogeymen in our society and the mainstream and the establishment, there's a consensus. It's one of the few things there's a consensus about. You know, Going to war is a good idea and the deficit is a bad thing. Those are the two basic consensus items in our political system nowadays. And so I, it, it really, it's terrible to hear Nancy Pelosi pushing PAYGO because it buys into this. And the Republicans push it too, but they, don't, they obviously don't believe in it because they're always the ones who are ballooning the deficit. When, and then Clinton comes into office or Obama comes into office and they have to cut our, uh, the, the debt. So, or the deficit, I should say. And, uh, and they think they should be applauded for it. But of course, they don't get any credit for it. And now we have the tax cuts that balloon the deficit again. And I think it, it has to do with this idea that people think, well, I balance my checkbook, why can't the government balance its books? And I, I don't know if this is an apt uh, analogy, but I like to say that, you know, uh, uh, people do go and engage in deficit spending. When you, when you buy a house, uh, you are you know, borrowing money to buy that house for the long term. And there is a benefit to you uh, financially in the long term of owning a house. And I feel like the same is true sort of to a degree with the government when you go into deficit spending. If you're spending it on Medicare for all and for free college and for social programs, that is going to benefit the economy overall. Whereas defense spending or interest on the debt, it does very little to benefit the, the larger economy. Is, but breaking through to the, the general public, especially when the establishment media is so in the bag for against the deficit, I don't know what the, what the best way to break through that is. And it really doesn't help that Nancy Pelosi is, is, is doing what she's saying. So do you feel like the Bernie campaign did any, you know, made any progress in that regard? Or are, is that just a battle that we just need to keep fighting? I mean, I don't think that the presidential campaign um, did much to sort of tackle this sort of problem that we face in terms of, you know, how do we change the narrative? How do we change the public debate so that when uh, a, a policymaker, you know, whether it's Senator Sanders or another member of Congress, when somebody goes out and says, this is the policy idea. I just introduced a piece of legislation. This is what I'd like to see us do. And the person sits down with them on TV or radio or whatever. And the first question out of the gate is always, how are you going to pay for it? So how do we how do we begin to push the narrative in a different direction where you say, so tell me about that legislation. What is it you hope that legislation will do? Oh, I hope that legislation will provide health care to this many people. And why do you think that's important? And but we get completely bogged down with starting the, the discussion with what is the impact on the budget going to be? Instead of what is the impact on people's lives going to be? What is the benefit to the economy? Does this serve the public interest? Is this some boondoggle thing you're proposing or is this good policy? Does the public broadly support this? Do, the, do Americans want this? We don't have those conversations. We start and end the discussion with the government's budget as if the the impact as if the budget has feelings as if the budget <laughs> cares whether it ends up in a budget deficit or a surplus at the end of the day which just the number we write down and whether we accomplish something good or not is what matters the number we had to write down to get to the good economy doesn't matter a whole lot let's say bernie sanders uh, wins the presidency in 2020 uh, you're the secretary of treasury <laughs> what how do you reshape uh, the way we spend money as the government. How? How? What? 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 What would we? What would someone like me notice? Different is happening in Washington D.C. with the budget. What would you do? 
Well, I mean, the treasure, the secretary of treasury's um, probably most important role in this would be helping to reshape the narrative. So helping, you know, to create the rhetorical space for a better conversation because the secretary of treasury doesn't write and pass legislation, right? So um, the treasury secretary can do things like avoid doing what uh, Jack Lew and Larry Summers have done more recently, right? Both former treasury secretaries. And now that the Trump administration has added to the deficit through, you know, tax cuts of about 1.5 trillion and then a $300 billion spending bill and whatever else may come down the pike, the Republicans are talking about another round of tax cuts. And you got two former treasury secretaries who have publicly said that because of what the Republicans have done, they've eaten up all the space and there's no more room for anybody in the future to do anything more because the deficits are gonna be too big. And so what message is that to, to Democrats that might take the House, the Senate, the White House, who knows what combination of things going, looking forward to 2020. If your message as Democrats is, uh, we got nothing because the last administration, you know, gave out all the goodies and now the, the um, you know, the well is dry, so to speak. So the, the Treasury Secretary can play an important role, I think, in helping to reshape the, the, the dialogue and so forth. But there's not a lot they can do directly in terms of policy. So with Nancy Pelosi already ensconced in Pago and Chuck Schumer, uh, just as big of a uh, corrupted, bought by Wall Street, a politician as you can have, right? Um, why would people vote for Democrats? So why, so it, it seems like no matter, if we have a blue wave, it doesn't matter because Nancy Pelosi's in bed with Steve Mnuchin and his donors. I mean, she's gonna do ex the exact bidding. She's already signaled it for no reason whatsoever. It's inexplicable to you, it's inexplicable to me. The only reason she would do it is because she's actually working against the people and she's working for the 1.1%. That's the old, why, there's no logical reason why she would propose PAYGO, especially in the face of a one point whatever trillion dollar tax cut we just had. Right, because just as you said, the Republicans don't care about deficits. They do their agenda and they blow right through it. The only people who care are Nancy Pelosi. I don't think she really cares about deficits. I think she just cares about pleasing her donors. So uh, right now, Bernie Sanders is, is trying to get people to join that party. Instead of building another party that actually has a different theory on how to run the country, do you think we can get it done by reforming the Democratic Party? Which, by the way, that's never going to happen, ever. <laughs> that will never, ever, ever happen. That's never going to happen. Jimmy, people say, I know, I people know, say I know is, your position on this. People say it's <laughs> difficult to start a third party. Well, it is impossible to reform the Democratic Party, and, and it's not happening. So what do you think about that, the idea of a third party or reform the Democratic Party? Jimmy, I know your position on this. I, I think that, you know, it's been inspiring to see some of the people who have run for office, some successfully, and some of some are going to go on and become elected uh, members of Congress, and some may try again in two years. Uh, as Democrats, they're trying to work within the party apparatus. I don't know whether they can get there in uh, a timeline that is, you know, sufficient to sort of, um, you know, save the planet, uh, sort sort of thing. But um, you know, I I don't know the answer to this. I'm not a political scientist. I don't know uh, how difficult it would be to whether it would be more difficult to launch a, a strong third party alternative or to try to keep getting these incremental victories with some insurgent candidates who eventually, look, it didn't take a lot of Tea Party members to become a, a disruptive force for bad in the House. And so, you know, you've heard people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, sort of channeling that uh, they may try to form some sort of a, a coalition of progressives to uh, in the House once elected. And so I don't, I don't know is the answer to the question. I, as you were talking, I sort of was wondering if we were, if we were willing to be extremely magnanimous and say, is there any way that Nancy Pelosi's um, pago comments could possibly make sense as a, um, you know, maybe she knows something we don't, and there's really a, a good <laughs> political calculation here. She's done the thinking, and we're just all missing it. And the the only thing I could come up with is. Suppose that this is something she's thinking from 2018 to 2020, we're going to have PAYGO rules in place. Yeah. 
And so it would make it more difficult to move, let's say, another major round of tax cuts through if you've got that kind of legislation, if you've got PAYGO instated. And then you could say, but then after 2020, depending on how things go, we may suspend the rule again. I don't know. Uh, I sort of doubt it, but I guess it's possible. You know, by the time the Democrats come around, uh, Manhattan and Miami will be underwater. <laughs> So, and that's a fact, that's gonna, that, that, that they're not gonna come around for another couple of decades. But anyway, Stephanie Kelton, uh, thank you so much for being our guest. Uh, it's been a real thrill to have you here, even though I'm not smart enough to completely understand everything you're saying. Um, and I went to college, I'm not, I actually, and my wife has a master's and she still also just is perplexed. But anyway, I really appreciate you taking time and you're always welcome back on the show. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey guys. We hope you enjoy this free clip of Aggressive Progressives on the Young Turks. This is just a preview of what you will receive with TYT membership. That means exclusive interviews, panel discussions, and more of Jimmy, and of course, me. If you like what you saw, you can access full episodes of Aggressive Progressives by becoming a member. Head to tyt.com join now.